Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I am delighted to introduce you to Jay Johnson, the CEO of COA's Creative Group, a professional training, coaching, and management consulting firm. Jay spent 15 years guiding leaders in organizational culture, working with amazing companies like Ford and organizations like NASA and General Dynamics and uh, institutions like J Johns Hopkins University. He's an active keynote speaker, author, has many, many millions of views on his TED Talk on how to deal with difficult people such as myself. Welcome to the pod, Jay. Thanks, Alex. Glad to be here with you. Well, almost everybody who is in, in uh, game-changing businesses runs into, at some point, dealing with people that are challenging them in uh in uh, good ways or bad so let's dive in a little bit of uh, that topic uh just for the human interest uh story of like so everybody gets a nugget that could take away into their work life into their family lives what is the secret to uh dealing with quote unquote difficult person yeah i'll lean into the kind of uh, key key statement there it's your heart attack and you should not be having a heart attack because of somebody else's behavior. If we recognize that we can only control ourselves, then we need to look at tactics to be able to give ourselves the best opportunity to be able to navigate some of those situations. So when you say heart attack, you know, I'll put my spin on it and, and you guide me a little bit if I'm getting this, this right. You would say that there's a gap between a stimulus that I'm getting from this quote unquote difficult person and how I respond to it, my response. And if I am trained in the ways of the Stoics and, you know, have self-awareness and create a gap that their reaction does not require kind of into Im immediate, some sort of, uh, um, amygdala hijacking happening on my end, I can actually take that response and, you know, create a gap, you know, interpret it and not be caught in a difficult, non-productive discussion. Is that a fair uh, in interpretation? I'm, I'm throwing a bunch of stuff in here, but you, you guide me, please. Yeah, absolutely. It's a fair interpretation. You know, when we think about if you've ever experienced that situation where you were dreading going to work or dreading dealing with a client, that is actually producing a lot of anxiety, cortisol, adrenaline, norepinephrine in your system. And that, that has a huge impact on your central nervous system, your cognitive capacity, and a number of other things. And, and while it seems, I, I, you know, I love stoicism, and a lot of people say, great, how am I supposed to do that? Because I'm dealing with these people and they frustrate mm -hmm. me and so on and so forth. I like to use our predictive behavioral intelligence model and what that looks like is I want you to imagine you were sitting on the couch watching a horror movie with your partner or one of your friends. And, you know, the movie builds up and then halfway through the movie, right as you hit the crescendo, boom, the ghost goes by and uh, everybody jumps and scared. Well, then your friend takes the remote and if it's Netflix goes back like the 10 seconds and the ghost goes across again and then does it again. And then does it again. So you've seen the ghost now four, five, six times. How many times before that ghost would come across the screen, before you would stop having that sort of natural reaction to it, or you'd become uh, essentially knowing that it's coming, you'd be able to predict it. Well, if you think about difficult people, their behaviors are patternistic. So even though we see the same behavior over and over and over again, we get mm. frustrated or angry with it every single time that is a choice and what we do is teach tactics to help people to choose a better regulated response so it's not about not being upset by it because they're still going to make me angry they're still going to frustrate mm -hmm. me but it's really about being able to predict that which then allows me to put in an influence measure or a control measure to make sure that i have control over my own behavior Interesting. So what if that difficult person is ourselves? Well, that's why I started uh, teaching on difficult people is it was a it was a journey of self-discovery. And uh, mm -hmm. a big part of that is actually where our drives come from. So t we tend to 
we tend to find people difficult that maybe don't have the same type of drives, underlying core biological drives that we have. And that's one of the kind of primary areas that I study with the behavioral elements program. So for example, I'm really strong in the drive to acquire and the drive to learn, meaning that I'm highly competitive and I wanna create new things and I wanna get them to market really, really fast. Well, if your drives were, say, that of the drive to bond, if your strongest drives were the drive mm -hmm. to bond and the drive to defend, that's much more systems and process focused and people oriented thinking. We end up finding a lot of clash in between those different drives. And when we're experiencing that as part of uh, our everyday work styles or our everyday interactions, it can have a huge impact on how we perceive somebody else to be difficult or whether they're very well aligned with us in our work approach. Got it. So it sounds like there is a the sort of a motivational set or motivation slash value set that the, like as, if those are aligned, it's a little bit easier and just awareness of that. Um, there's another one that I think is related and that is, you know, are people operating with the same set of data about how the world works, right? So it, it may be almost separate from their predisposition, but it's just like, that's a set of facts that I have about the world. And if you have a very different set of facts, that may be something else that needs to be unpacked in order to us to find a common language. Um, so kind of almost a filter through which we interpret everything. How do you... Yeah, you know, how do you dig into that and how do you help establish a filter? And I think particularly I bring that up because sometimes that's um you know, it may be something that you could bring up in written communications as well. Like some people uh I've noticed using relate to, we had a customer who said, here's a manual to how to work with me. Right. And and it's a pretty sophisticated way of sharing this with um, vendors with colleagues, um, if uh, could be with family members, like this is this is what this is a great you know collection of what I know about myself at least, and willing to share it with other people, organized, and then you you all of a sudden say, wow, that's really interesting. I would have never assumed that that's a way to deal with that person because either my values are slightly. A different in some areas or my 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 like even the idea of sharing something like that is foreign to me so my data set is different guide us a little bit on how people are making it easy to communicate with them for people that are maybe in different time zone different cultures different uh like we said data set of of their experiences and yet they need to find a way to work together in our crazy remote, you know, and, and very a diverse world that we live in. Yeah. And it's a really astute point, Alex. You know, when we think about how people show up, they are, we all are limited by our own experiences, our own knowledge base, uh, the way in which we interpret the world, the way that we've been influenced by external factors such as culture, socioeconomics, et cetera. One of my big pieces is to always be curious. And I'll even relate this to, say, the digital space and remote work. What I mean by staying curious and, you know, we've heard people say, OK, give grace and do this. But I like to always start, if, especially if I hear something from a difficult person or if I hear something in it or I see something in an email that maybe triggers some kind of response or reaction for me. I immediately go into my behavioral science background and start going, why? What was the stimulus that created this? What experience were they having right now? What experience have they had this week? What experience have they had this month? This is one of the things that we actually train customer service representatives on is being able to understand that sometimes when you're getting yelled at in the moment, it's really not about that moment. It is about the week or the month or even the life that that person may have. And if you're right. able so it's to not only is it not about you and <laughs> right. like, right, because that's the first assumptions like, oh, they're yeah. yelling. I must they must be really unhappy with me. We could have go back into our like seven year old or 11 year old kid where everything is about us. It's that's like, right. ah, they don't like me. Ah, you know, right. <laughs> and then you're saying, well, it's not even that it's about like there could be this their context right and then 
this is all in the context of their week of their life and their childhood. And then you have a much more permission to accept that person. And it's almost like one of those TV series where there's a deeply flawed character that you somehow still like because you understand that the their flaw is not necessarily their their fault right it's it's just the way that life turned out for them is that yeah yeah you know and being able to recontext that through curiosity or trying to learn about like what what let's be honest i mean most people don't actively go what is the dumbest response that i can have right now in this very moment most people think that whatever their behavior is, is their best behavioral choice or their best behavioral action in that moment. Now, we come to regret many of our behaviors or we come mm-hmm. to regret, oh, I wish I would have handled that differently. But if we, as the person on the receiving end of that, actually take a curiosity framework and say, why? Where did that come from? What were the conditions? You know, so say I get, uh, you know, say, say I get an email that has what I would read as a really harsh tone to it. Yeah. And I, I immediately react like, gosh, why are they being so direct or why are they being so aggressive? And then I pause and I take a step back and I go, well, what would be conditions that would create the directness of this email? Maybe they were busy. Maybe they just needed this problem solved and off their plate. Maybe they had a really rough morning with their team or with their family, or maybe there's something going on. There's a number of stories that we end up telling ourselves. So if I come at it from a point of curiosity, I can create multiple stories about what the behavior is, and they might help explain some of those behaviors in a more functional and productive way. And it gives me the opportunity to ask questions and seek clarifications. Yeah. And I I would throw throw in a challenge into that where you're putting the onus on the recipient of the communication. And we see that the best communicators that are senders of the communication also engage in curiosity, right? And their curiosity is about how would their message be received, especially if you're doing important one to many or even the really important one to few, one to one message that you can't deliver in full fidelity, right? In a conversation that we're having, how do you do that in a synchronous way? And um, email to your point, it's like, a, it's a look like it doesn't express, you know, that you're smiling when you're writing this. Or that you know you, you have your cheeky sense of humor doesn't come across. It, like you need to be very very explicit to get the email right, and oftentimes you can't. But then um, you know same same sometimes applies to presentations. But if you have your presentation and then you add a little video introduction on top of that, just to kind of humanize it, so that they there's you know that there's a person behind these ideas. And you kind of explain the complex points that you're worried about that are just not enough to, to they, they fall flat on the slide. But if you could walk through them, share the passion, you know, for those that are interested, may want to drill in just like in a conversation, do you provide, you know, 30 minute response to a topic or you, you provide an option to hear the 30 minute response to a particular area, if that's a re- area of real interest, right? Like you don't want to, here's 30, 30 minutes on this page, 30 minutes on that, 30 minutes on that, right? But that becomes an, an enormous monologue. So you create an interactive a layer. So I, I wonder what you're seeing happens with the best communicators um, that facilitate this real human exchange in in the in the context where you know maybe presentation that you present but like the information is a little bit like harmonica it expands depending on areas of interest and makes some beautiful sounds or if it's self-serve that it feels conversational and it naturally taps the curiosity that you're bringing in but it sort of unlocks the curiosity versus data dumps you know, and like, I have to say it, I have to communicate it. It doesn't matter how you receive it. It doesn't matter what you do with it. I need to express myself. Boom, boom. Right. That, that sort of feels like a, you know, we got caught into that trap of the need to express ourselves without the curiosity about the recipient. Yeah. You know, 
any good communication is going to account for the fact that there are two people that are of minimally two people that yeah. are part of it, otherwise you're talking to the wall, right? So a couple of different things that we train our um, managers, our teams, and you know the people that we work with, we teach them identify your tone. Now, some people don't feel comfortable sending out emojis, and that's perfectly okay. You know, in an email, I don't want to necessarily look like, super unprofessional with like, you know, smiley face, laughing face, et cetera. But in my emails, yeah, right, big old hearts. In my emails, you know, I will put, hey, team, this is a sensitive conversation. I want to find out what had occurred, but I want you to understand my tone is of curiosity, not of punishment or not of anger. We really just need to better understand what this situation is so we can move forward. Here are my questions. Now, if I just started with, here are my questions, they're going to be on that defensive right out of the gate because they're going to go, oh my gosh, we're trying to uncover what this issue is or challenge is. I don't want to get blamed. I That's natural. That's natural human behavior. Yeah. So being able to clearly identify your tone, another really cool way to do this and that we've been really uh, promoting amongst some of the managers that we've been training, if you're sending an email that has questionable tone, send a very short voice note with it alongside of it uh you could do that on whatsapp you could do that on yeah. um you know any of the social media hey alex uh hope you got my email just wanted to let you know really appreciate all the things that you're doing if you get a second and you can send something back to me today that would be wonderful now they've heard your tone they didn't just see your message but they've also heard your tone yeah. there's a follow-up humanistic piece to it and the video idea which you do very well by the way uh is absolutely fantastic to go along with that yeah, and I think that we focus a lot on maybe one to many or sales and marketing situations where there's there's more time to prepare for the quality of content engagement. And I don't think that's you don't need to apply that bar to everything, right? Like I think you what you're bringing up is like even in formal situation and I would raise my hand, I could do better with my team sometimes, you know, in the while I may be curious about the answer, I'm not sure the the questions without that context uh, will uh, will people kind of their heart will start bumping up a little bit. It's like Alex is demanding excellence that I probably messed up and et cetera. So I, you know, there's a, all this a persistent effort, I think that we need to do as leaders to be aware that what seems small to us could be much wider spectrum to the audience that, uh, maybe doesn't have regular contact with us, right? Doesn't have that, uh, you know, doesn't have the ability to interpret that in a, in a um, long, like a lot of, along the lot of dots of a relationship uh, form factor, right? Like, so that it's, oof, you know, first time I contact my boss and he doesn't love my work. Oh my God, I'm like, this, this must be a very stressful moment for people. Is that kind of the implication of not getting it right that, um, that you're bringing up? Yeah, I think one of the things that I would say is a good communicator is going to be somebody who can handle their own communication failures or communication issues, take ownership of them. Sometimes we have to apologize. Sometimes it's yeah. simply, sometimes the simple act of, hey, my intention wasn't to create these conditions conditions. I understand that I did that. How might I be able to do that better for you the next time that we have a conversation? And literally digging in again, back into that curiosity, but being able to identify, hey, I messed up. That's okay. We are all human. We yeah. all make communication gaffes, errors. And that little bit of humility in that space can really go a long way to furthering trust and building that relationship in a way that is uh, mutual and that the next time that we communicate, it's more effective than the last. Got it. Well, th this this actually is a really great lead in to one of the uh, uh, data points that you've shared about what constitutes a communication. So I'm going to quote you and let's let's interpret that as particularly what it means in the digital context. So you say communications can really be broken down to three different things, body language, tone and inflection. And the third one is the spoken word. 55% is coming from body language, 38 from tone and inflection, 7% from the actual message that comes in the language uh, that we choose. And so the question becomes, what if we take that 
and move it out of just video alone and think of broadly speaking a digital context, right? Asynchronous, which everybody is doing on Slack or email. Um, and it could be, again, sales oriented. So it could be with people that are external to us, don't have the bandwidth to do it. How do they understand the real person behind this, right? How do we make sure that our body language is congruent with our tone and inflection and congruent with the message? And I kind of, I'll argue the example that I see and then I'll let you react. So people put together a proposal and there the, would be, Something like, um, here's eighty, you know, eighty page um, proposal that I put together for you. Very excited to share it with you. It's eighty pages um, of um, content about blah 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 blah, and it's you know going to help your digital transformation, you know, inside this PDF, right? And so, you know, the, like I think there's a total incongruence here. Tone is not exciting. Eighty pages of something that sounds very boring, but you say that you're excited. Um, digital transformation being presented in a piece of paper is not credible. So there's sort of the sort of incongruences that you could throw out there that doesn't feel right, right? It, like if the proposal itself was not exciting visually, then you saying that it's exciting and that you're motivated and that you'll be easy to work with doesn't align somehow. So these are some of the common uh, missteps that we see people are like are doing in their written visual communications. Uh, what do you see and how do you apply the principles in kind of these types of interactions that you share or emails into that kind of more written visual communication focus? It's a great question, Alex. And you know those those breakdowns of body language, tone, inflection, and the spoken word uh, were actually research done by Albert Morabian. And there's some other research that says ah, that's that's maybe not perfect. But for the purposes of using it here, let's imagine that you're preparing for a speech. More than likely, you sat down and you wrote out all the words and you're, you know, most people, I, I personally don't, but, you know, most people are writing out words or they write out their thoughts and, and they're tweaking this word and they're changing this word and they spend a lot of their energy and effort on the actual text. And if we do look at any of the body language literature or anything else like that, we realize that we're spending a majority of our time on the part that has the least amount of impact. And when we think about that 7% or whatever percentage the spoken word accounts for in our communication, that leaves a lot of space to be lost. Here's a couple of rules that I like to follow when I'm putting together my 80-page proposal. One, if I find myself skimming my own proposal, it's probably a good sign that it's not matching what I want to accomplish. Number two, if I get bored while I'm reading my own proposal, I can assure you that your audience is going to get bored too. So how do I determine some of these things? In and some bored cases, means like you're not proud about it. You're like, there's there's all sorts of like, you're not excited. It's not a, it's not putting your best foot forward, right? Is that kind of like broadly speaking, what does that, what does bored mean? Yeah. If I'm not enjoying reading my own text, yeah. No one else is going to. So that means that there's probably lacking enthusiasm, lacking energy. If I were to take my text or my proposal and read it out loud and record myself reading it, how would it sound? Could I give no. that same reading in a different way and think about it like I could read it with a lot of excitement? Could I also read it with a lot of just mundaneness and see what that sounds like? Because we're going to have a variant, a very, uh, you know, wide range of how people are going to experience that document. Having other people take a look at it and say, hey, if you were to give me three words, three emotions that come out as you read this first page, what emotions would those be? Getting somebody else to give you that feedback helps us get out of our own head and be able to predict what potentially a reader or somebody is going to do. But yes, that congruence is so important. When we feel dissonance in communication yeah. or in dissonance in behaviors, it's an immediate turnoff. And it's uh, something that, you know, even subconsciously can have a huge impact on reducing trust. So I think the key word is what you're bringing up. It's, it's trust, right? Like, why are you doing this? proposal, right? Like you want to establish a trusted relationship. 
and you ideally we live in a complex world where nobody wants to be you know hating what they're doing whether you're delivering your service right or somebody's receiving your service and so there's a part of it that i would put enjoying the act of expressing yourself and connecting with this other individual right like doing the best communication of your life right that so you feel like that is just sort of you're you're jumping out of a page or or video whatever is the medium that you deliver that's sort of one idea but the other one that i i really love and i'd love to get your experience like a take on it is this notion of autonomy so if you're in a monologue right and you just get a lecture and everybody gets the identical lecture everybody's in the audience listening to the same identical lecture which is the traditional way to deliver amazing keynotes and you know how to do that that as actually works maybe when the expectation is right and and the the you have the sort of 15 minute masterpiece of a ted that's sort of relevant for everybody but it's not the reality of a proposal it's not because there's different people that are going to be different and in, in, interested in different bits of the proposal and they may be even the same person on a different time zone of the engage of the of their engagement with your content may be diff- interested in different bits and depending on where they're consuming it is it in bed in their ipad or is it in front of a large screen or is it on their phone on the move they may want to even get very different nuggets and so i worry that when we apply our traditional one to many uh, communications mode we're forgetting that 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 world is gone Right. That world was great for Steve Jobs doing his delivery to gazillions of people. And he was a master orator and that like master presenter. But we live in the sort of interactive. I, I pick my own adventure. I sk- skip to the areas that I care about. But when you present a long form content, that's one like just basically monolithic, you know, non not interactive, not letting you jump to the things that you want or consume the mediums that you prefer because you have everybody has their own preferred styles of how they want to consume content. We miss this huge opportunity to upgrade our communication stack. What's your take on that um, personalization layer? Uh, and how do we accomplish it in our current digital landscape? You know, I think we lean into, and it's a good question, Alex, I think we lean into what has worked throughout human history, and that's really the power of storytelling. Um, As you navigate, whether it's a written document, whether it's a speech, whether it's a training or anything else, humans understand the world around them based on stories. Now, if I just tell you my story and what my story is, that's one level of storytelling. But the reality is, I need to be telling stories in which the person that I'm communicating to can see themselves in that story. Now, once they've been in that experience, right? Like even even at the beginning of this, I I give an example of Netflix and sitting on a couch and watching, you know, a movie, a scary movie with a partner or whomever. Most people could at least identify, okay, I've sat on a couch before, I've done this. I can imagine myself sitting in that position. So as I'm telling stories or I'm utilizing a story framework, what I'm really trying to do is help the audience member find themselves as the hero of that story, whatever that is. Maybe they're going to overcome their big challenge or their big difficult person. Maybe they're the person that's going to sell that next huge proposal because that's what they're looking for or solving their cultural challenges. When we can create stories in which our communication partner finds themselves in, identifies with, relates to, that's number one, going to build trust. Number two, memory recall six th- six times faster and more prevalent. It's actually going to have more meaning within the context of that communication. I love it. I think this is a great place to wrap up with one addition. So I would say there is a story. So you pick the story. Like we believe, we agree that storytelling is important, but in today's day and age, you have the choice of which stories resonate with you. Right inside that proposal, which case study do you care about? Right, you don't need to go through them linearly. You know that I want to hear what you've done with Ford, because I am, you know, another automotive manufacturer, right? And that's the story I want to go on first, not the one that was laid out in the linear 
structure by a monologue thing. So I'm picking the story. I'm connecting to the story. I think something else happens. And that's what I would call we have a need for autonomy. And I think that is becoming a more and more important need. So we in a communication do not want to be stuck in a like one way uh, type of monologue engagement, right? We want to pick and control and know where we are and know when, when can we wrap up this, this, this content, right? I want to know that it's, I'm going to drill in, but it's a two minute drill in. I don't need to watch your two hour webinar. I want to get to the, to the two minute segment that really resonates. And if I love that, then I could choose to expand, right? So it's sort of these quick trust building steps that keep me in control. No, what's my investment. And I think that's lost somewhere because the model that we learn from is not like that. It's, it is much more still one to many performance. And then you just try in that one to many performance, meet everybody's needs somehow. If you're a master, you can do it, but we no longer need to do that, right? We don't need to be doing the world's best uh, monologue that meets everybody's needs, right? Like that's Citizen Kane, which, you know, you're like, who can do Citizen Kane? Who can do Hemingway, right? right. Like I, not as your average B2B creator, unfortunately. And so we could, but we could give them a sense of creating an exciting journey for their audience. And that's sort of back to trust and a relationship that sort of, hey, we are co-creating something because you give me a set of options and out of that, I create my own story. And that story is special because we're, it's like we're watching that TV on Netflix and we're discussing it together and we're interpreting it together. And I'm taking your points and you're taking my points. So we're making some, the one plus one equals three. Do you, does this, does this feel right? The sort of autonomy plus co-creating a story versus consuming a story? Yeah, I, I don't think in the history of ever has somebody wanted to be talked at, you know, they want to be talked with and they want to contribute to the conversation and reciprocity as a psychological principle is something that's there. You know, even Ernest Hemingway did say that any good story should be able to be told in six words or less. Now, I don't know if he actually did that, uh, but when we think about it, what you're talking about is people with a proposal or with a communication or long form content, they're coming in and saying, marry me. And in dating, no one ever just says yes, yeah. right? On the first cool. What's your name? What's your name? Yeah, exactly. you know, instead of what's your right? name, you're like, marry me. Let's get it. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe we start by having a drink or dinner or yeah. something, you know? Yeah. So uh, think about that too, is as you're developing content or as you're developing anything out, are you really getting somebody to marry you? Or are you asking them out on the first date? And maybe they've taken that first date. Now it's time for the second date, which could be a little bit longer. And the third date, which maybe has an extended, you know, an extended outdoor activity that goes with it and so on and so forth. And you build up. But yeah, to your point, that is human nature. We know that in other contexts. However, in business, in many cases, we forget and we try to, um, you know, we try to have such an expansive approach that we end up, you know, basically just boring the hell out of people. Yeah. And uh, I think this is this is fantastic summary that, you know, you need to apply humanity with behavioral and neuroscience principles to have this empathy and, and you know, creativity. But also there's some fundamental principles that you're sharing through your work that are just universal evidence driven ways in which people can succeed in these high stakes communications, because I think the ultimate tragedy when we say, well, we messed this up in business, but we do this well on Netflix or somewhere else, is that we live in then in a society where we suck at communicating the important ideas. And because there are savvy people in the entertainment industry or or some sort of adrenaline generating spam industry and the email, we get really good at communicating shallow ideas that don't do anything good for us. Don't move the world forward. Don't help us wrestle with complex, important ideas. And so this is a dichotomy where there's part of us that's consumerized till we don't have to think. And then there's another part that's getting shy from engaging and wrestling with the important issues of the day. And we want those people that are wrestling with important ideas have 
an advantage in how they communicate. So Jay, how can people find that advantage through your work? Where can they find you and connect uh, with, with your thought leadership on this topic? Yeah, I would encourage people to go to www.behavioralelements.com. There's an assessment there and taking that assessment is a 10 minute assessment and it's going to help people to understand what their primary drives are. So those four drives, the drive to acquire, the drive to bond, the drive to defend and the drive to learn. What is that primary drive that you have? That is actually going to give you some real strong awareness and insights to what type of a communicator you are, how you make your decisions, how you like to be communicated to, how your body language may show up. It's all in the report from that behavioral assessment. I think that's a great place to start and then connect with me on LinkedIn. So I'll be sharing content constantly about behavioral balance and how do we create the conditions for effective relationship building and trust building amongst the people that we interact with every single day. So thank you, Alex. Really appreciate that. Awesome, Jay. This has been a lot of fun and incredibly useful.